because there have been major changes uh, to what we have, as you will soon hear. Uh, I think it's interesting that Joe was uh, a member of this club way, way back in his teen years. Um, and then he was off doing other stuff in the Coast Guard and been working uh, as a manager in a local company and he reactivated uh, his membership as recently as 2011 and here he is, our observatory chairman. What that means, by the way, is if you're fairly new to the club within the last few years, you can be a, a nominee for our outreach person. <laughs> Don't feel like you have to have been a part of the club for 10 or 20 years to, to do that job. Okay? We, we really need somebody, and it's a really important uh, <coughs> job, and you don't have, just because you're a chairman of outreach doesn't mean you have to do it all. You know, you can ask people for help. So, uh, again, Joe's going to be talking about the new Stargate Observatory. <coughs> Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Dale, you want to kill the lights? Yeah. Or half of them. Um, we'll probably turn them all out. That's all right. So, uh, as Dale said, I'm um, coordinating the events out at Stargate for the, the past year. Um, but really, I spent time there as a child, and, and I wanted to, not a child, but a teenager. Um, That's a child. Yeah. Oh, trust me, I was a child. <laughs> I wanted to... Uh, I just had some really fond memories of the place and, and wanted to stay involved there. Um, the telescope, the observatory started to get some major renovations on the building itself and they weren't quite finished. The telescope wasn't reinstalled. So um, I got together with Riyad Mahdi, who was the observatory chairman at that time, and offered uh, my help as much as I could give it to kind of get, to get it opened back up. Everybody hear me okay? So, uh, before we get into too much detail on the new telescope, I want to talk about kind of the history of the building itself and, and the uh, telescope. So, the earliest reference I could find to it was in the WASP, actually the very first edition of it, back in 1969, March. There was a note about a, f a report that was being filed by Richard Paulus, who was a member at the time, uh, one of the founding members. And he was meeting with the grounds committee at Camp Rotary uh, with uh, discussion about building a structure, a wooden structure, that might possibly have power in it. So that was March of 1969. In May of 1969, the grounds committee approved the design but preferred a block building with a round dome. And it would be powered. Uh, it was presented to the Board of Directors for Camp Rotary. In 1970, July, basically a year later, the building, telescope, and dome were finished at Camp Rotary. That's an image um, that was forwarded by Andy Kula, who I'll talk about in a little bit. It shows the telescope uh, back at that time, right around 1970. And uh, looks a little different. Well, it did look a little different until it got decommissioned. So um, August 26th I found a reference to the, the first official opening which was uh, also in 1970. Um, of course the observatory opened under cloudy skies. That's relatively familiar. Then another reference to it in 1970 about a UFO that was sighted at the campground. If you actually read it, uh, it sounds like the dome maybe blew off the building, which surprises me because it's incredibly heavy. 1970, they were ready to bomb it, burn it up, because apparently they haven't had a clear night out there in, in months. So they had a brand new telescope, brand new building, and nothing but clouds and rain. 
We jump to uh, November 1970, and looks like they had their first successful open house. If you go back to the WASP, these were the observatory updates. They were basically cartoon uh, cartoons that were drawn to represent what was going on at the observatory. <coughs> they still referred to it as the WASP obser or the WASP obser observatory. Um, January of 71, Frank McCullough, who was the editor of the newspaper at the time, proposed that it be named after three uh, members that were significantly contributing to the observatory. Ironically, uh, one of them was Larry Kalinowski, who I'm going to talk about a little bit later as well. Um, I, I couldn't find any references on where that was going, but in uh, um, just a, a, about a year later, one of the newsletters shows up with the name Stargate um, on the face of the observatory. So at some point, you know, they made a decision, maybe uh, ask the members where the name, you know, what they should name the observatory. Couldn't find any details on that, but uh, the name stuck. It's been Stargate ever since. We'll add that, like Dale mentioned, I had spent some time out there. This was probably about 1977. That's a friend of mine. Um, you know, we would go out and open up the observatory and try and give some relief to the regular board member or the members of the, the club that were out there. It seemed like every weekend. And of course, I actually made the wasp back in March of 1977. So, the go observatory. Back, go back to that previous slide. Yes. There you see Joe Toko. Yes, that's why I said I made the what I made the papers. Um, so the observatory realized it hasn't changed significantly since then. That, I took that picture uh, sometime last summer. Uh, Bill Beers was well. We were out there doing something, but so you know the biggest thing we had to do to get the observatory open back up was was get the telescope back in place. There was definitely some things that we had to address at the time. One of them was the dome drive, which operated on these two hinges. And that, those are actually hinges. I, I didn't think so at the time when I took it off. I thought it was just a piece of angle iron. But they were just so heavily corroded that they stopped working. Um, the drive and the hinges were uh, rebuilt to the best of my ability without having them remachined or, or buying a new assembly to replace it. And they were put back in place, and they're functional. And then uh, the next step that we had to address was actually installing a wooden floor, which you know we always had plenty of volunteers to do the work out there. See uh, Gary Ross and Riyad Maddy in the background and the Kaplans. Um, they were a great help. We uh, built the floor up, reinstalled it, and put down decking. So everybody that's been out there since then, um, you know, has has seen that. Riyadh was happy because he could reach his telescope now. <laughs> uh, the other thing we did was we installed a new focuser because the focuser was shot. There were some dead spots on the rack, and we also cleaned the optics, which probably hadn't been cleaned since the telescope was reassembled sometime in the uh, in the early 90s. Um, Putting it back into the mount, that was back into the tube, was a little challenging. Luckily, uh, Riyadh has got vast experience with that telescope and with the observatory. Um, I couldn't have. He's been a huge help. He's been a great mentor to my first year as uh, observatory chairman. So we got the mirror back in. We got the focuser in. We got it fully collimated, and. And we went out there sometime in November and installed carpeting. Carpeting looks like it's uh, going to keep the place nice and warm, but trust me, it still gets cold. But I'm glad we're off the concrete. Uh, another thing we did was put in some safety <coughs> fixtures over the lights. There used to be bare bulbs hanging in the observatory. Now they're protected and, and they're actually shielded. Even the red bulbs are blacked out toward the telescope, so you can't even see them. So 
So this is kind of a melancholy section here. Uh, this was last light, ironically, on National Astronomy Day. <coughs> the uh, Cassegrain <coughs> saw its last use, and fortunately it was a clear night. This wasn't that night. I snuck it in there because there was people in it. Um, but we did have a nice turnout. Um, we had a lot of people look through the telescope, a lot of people try and take pictures through the telescope unsuccessfully. But they enjoyed looking through it. And uh, this was probably about 3 in the morning one night. Oh, well, that was that night. I ended up sleeping at the observatory. Too tired to drive home, so I laid on the floor um, with a couple of blankets and, uh, and a pillow. And before I fell asleep, I was just playing around with my camera and a red light flashlight and uh, captured this image. And, um, Oh, it's one of my favorites that I've taken. So the weekend after that, we decommissioned the, the telescope, removed it from the mount, and moved it into the dob shed where it sits today. Uh, we haven't really decided what to do with that right now. Um, I don't feel that uh, it's, it's certainly a significant piece of equipment with a great deal of history here. Um, it was built by the founding members of the club. Um, it doesn't seem right to, to try and sell it or get rid of it. And it actually is a, it's a, optically a very good telescope. Um, so it sits in storage. Um, is that a 16 inch? Uh, uh, it was 12 and a half. Oh, 12 and a half, okay. Yep. So the new telescope finally came in from DNG. It's a 8-inch refractor. We wanted to put it in the mount, the existing mount, so I built the wooden cradle that stepped down the, uh, the, the cradle down to the 9-inch diameter tube. And with the help of uh, some of the other members, who you could see there, obviously, uh, we got the telescope installed, balanced it, and took it through its paces, made sure that it wasn't going to hit the inside of the dome. Um, it's just a series of pictures here showing us kind of manipulating it, moving it around. I don't think we actually used it that night, but we might have. I think we didn't get a clear night until the first open house. So um, the gentleman that is of some significance here is Andy Kula, who is standing right behind, directly behind the telescope, kind of looking underneath it. And, uh, and I'll get to him um, in a little bit as well. So the night of the first open house, um, I have a Nikon uh, digital camera, and, and I'm not an astrophotographer by any means. My astro photos are my iPhone through eyepiece projection from one of my telescopes. That's the extent of it. And this is the image of M13 through the 8-inch refractor. I think it was about a five-second exposure. And, uh, you know, somebody that knows what they're doing could probably produce an incredible image, much better than that. But, I mean, considering what it is and who took it, it's pretty spectacular. Uh, is that going in the calendar? Yeah, uh, I don't that know. should be in the calendar. I guess it could be. <laughs> First shot to the new scope. Yeah. Um, then this is an image of Saturn I took the same night. And uh, again, that's a single image. There's no stacking. There's no processing with it. Um, the, image, the image in your eye, ironically, is much better than what you're seeing here. M13 isn't as bright, but it certainly is. Um, you know, it looks good. So we de decommissioned the mount. Uh, that involved removing the telescope, rigging the chain fall, and actually hoisting it. The mount's pretty awkward. It's not terribly heavy, but definitely awkward in the height that it is. I thought the only safe way to do it was with the chain fall. So um, there's a series of photos here that just basically show us removing it. Um, and the, the volunteers that were there to help. Dale Teamy, you can get to show up for anything if you promise some chocolate chip cookies. I'm just saying. 
I never did buy any, but I, I probably owe them big time. So the old mounts off the pier, that is also stored in the dock shed um, off to the side. And in a place is the Astrophysics AP1200 GTO, which was donated generously by Andy Kula. And uh, Andy came out, he was instrumental <coughs> through this entire process coming out um, every time that we had work to do, uh, he was there pushing everybody out of the way to make sure things got done right. And arguing with Riyadh about the right way to do things. But the job was done well, it was done right, and uh, it looks great. I might add, if you have a fisheye lens and you're taking pictures of a room with a round ceiling, it works out really well. Sure. So that brings us to the telescope, the Kalinowski Kula telescope, which is beautiful. It uh, operates incredibly well. Um, this was the night that we got everything reinstalled. Uh, we're, we go through, we're, we're still going through a learning curve, the, uh, the rest of us. Um, Bob Berta and Andy Kula actually uh, know the mount really well, uh, but the rest of us, is, we're, we're learning it. Um, There's, there's definitely a learning curve with it. Um, you can see some of the uh, things that were added. The Telrad finder scope was, was added recently. And on the other side, there's a set of uh, custom rings that are currently holding a, a uh, 50 millimeter finder scope, but they will accommodate up to a 90 millimeter scope. So uh, 70, 80, or 90 millimeter finder scope slash guide scope is definitely in our future. Just another shot of it. Uh, I put a little spreadsheet here together, and, and this will actually get <coughs> laminated. It will be in the observatory. And it, it breaks down the eyepieces that we have for the telescope. Um, the significant things to, to know here are the, the power that they provide in that telescope and in the true field of view. So if you guys, you know, if you, you want to know, it'll be probably mounted up on the wall near the telescope. <coughs> Philip is the gentleman that I introduced, uh, the young man I introduced earlier, um, did a major project for us <coughs> to help improve the telescope, the grounds. And uh, this is Philip on the right. You can see uh, Brian Berta and Joey Lico, who are also members of the club, are there in the picture, along with two other scouts. Um, they put in this roll-up door on the dob shed, which alleviated all kinds of problems with storage, moving telescopes in and out of the, the dob shed. Um, they also, which this wasn't part of the job, but they were able to repurpose the door that re was removed from the dob shed onto the east door of the observatory, which basically hadn't had a doorknob in five or six years at least. It's also uh, rusted out at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Both both of the existing steel doors are well, they're 45 years old, so they're they're in rough shape. But these guys did an incredible job. Um, they even power washed the dob shed, the siding on the dob shed, so it, it looks great. Uh, reinstalled some nice flashing at the bottom where the weed weed eaters had beaten up the uh, the vinyl siding. You can see it here. A nice. Um, dark green siding on the bottom. It's aluminum too, it's in a plastic, so it should hold up there. Yeah. And then that's the uh, group, a few more of the scouts that were involved in, in the work there. These are all from uh, Troop 156, and there's, uh, right now there's four other uh, Boy Scouts from there that will be working on Eagle, for Eagle projects, and they are planning on doing them also out of the observatory. Yeah, I'll talk a, a little bit about that toward the end. Um, the additional projects they're interested in doing and see if we can't come up with uh, some ideas for, for a few more. So there's, there's two people that we have to thank for really where we're, where we're at. Um, Andy, who a lot of you guys know, if you don't, he's 
He's sitting in the back of the room there, um, wearing what looks like a train conductor cap. <laughs> so, uh, Andy has done something incredibly generous. Um, he had a an astrophysics mount that knew is probably twelve or thirteen thousand dollars, and he donated it outright to the club mm. for use in the observatory. Um, it was uh, it was an incredible opportunity for us, and uh, I, I just want everybody to know something about the man that you know that uh, that did that for us. So, uh, kind of start at the beginning with his parents, <laughs> right? Um, Andy was born in Winbur, Pennsylvania, on October twenty fifth, nineteen forty four. Winber is a small coal mining town uh, in western Pennsylvania with a population of about 3,500. And he told me there were 13 churches in Winber. All of them are Catholic. His mother and father had six children, <coughs> two girls, four boys, and Andy told me that they were a good, close-knit family. Andy's parents moved to Centerline, Michigan around 1949. They bought a fixer-upper that was built in 1940. His father didn't make much money then, but his mom was a saver. Andy started grade school in Centerline, three, bo three blocks north of Eight Mile. And as a young child, he never really looked skyward. He spent too much time searching head down for fossils in the gravel roads. After third grade, the family moved to their first new home, located two blocks <laughs> south of Seven Mile and west of Mound, near City Park. In 1956, an interest in telescopes and funding from a paper route, the Detroit Times, got him a mail-order 25-millimeter sliding cardboard telescope. It was purchased for $3.95, and Andy remember, remembers fondly that it was total crap. <laughs> this is not a picture of that telescope. This is a small telescope that Andy actually built. The space race and the launch of Sputnik fueled Andy's uh, interest in space and astronomy, and his parents never had means for much beyond a very modest lifestyle, but his father managed to buy him a small telescope in 1957 as a birthday gift. It was a 30 millimeter refractor uh, with a metal sliding tube made of brass. Uh, it was made in Japan with a single eyepiece. He was amazed. This telescope came from Silverstein's, a surplus shop in Detroit on Six Mile Road. And it showed lunar craters, the moons of Jupiter, and Saturn's, Saturn's rings. And he could see that Saturn actually had rings. He was really hooked now. The family moved again to Roseville, and his father worked hard to keep the family comfortable with the, 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 at least bare, bare necessities. And he had a paper route there and saved and saved, but never saved enough for a real telescope, you know, a big telescope. Andy finished high school without any real goals and promptly joined military service in September 1962. Authority didn't fit well into his life at the time, so he decided against reenlistment. He left the Marine Corps as a Lance Corporal with an honorable discharge in February of 96. He studied metalworking with his father under an apprenticeship and took classes at night to improve his understanding of mathematics so that he could advance in his career path. Working at one of the shops, he met and married his wife, Monique. And he wooed her from her then boyfriend, who showed up one day asking for her, and amply, Andy simply smiled and said that, hey, she left with some kind of blue Chevy. <laughs> Coincidentally, Andy drove a blue Chevy. <laughs> Probably helpful that he looked cool back then <laughs> and had a very big telescope. Okay, so the telescope came later. Occasionally, the cool escaped him, but not for long. Andy found time to grind his own four and a half inch mirror, and after starting a steady job, he bought the first of many telescopes, an Edmund 8 inch F8 on an Edmund heavy German equatorial mount. After a few years, aperture caught in, aperture fever caught him, 
And since Coulter Optics was offering a 12 and a half inch mirror for a mirror $175 delivered, and he jumped on it. The trip to Dearborn to get the eight foot tube, and Andy drove home with the monster tube strapped to his 1966 Mustang. He strapped it to the Edmund mount and stood back and stared because the telescope was definitely eye candy. Andy no longer has that tube, but he still has the excellent mirror. And he moved to Frankenmuth, Michigan, stayed two years, and then moved to Muskegon. There he joined the Muskegon Astronomical Society, did a lot of observing, built his first observatory and a second. And then he did a project for the, the Astronomical Society, building them a fork mount and helping them re, rebuild their dome. His next project was a 12 back up? Oh, yeah. Wow. <clears throat> What's the aperture on that? Andy? I believe that was a 10 inch. Wow. <clears throat> His next project was a 12 and a half inch F20 Dahl Kirkham Cassegram. He built an extremely heavy mount for it and traded it to a fellow from Chicago for a Celestron 8 because it was much more portable. This is the mount that he built. Mm -hmm. He still has the C8. In 1979, he moved back to Detroit and began building another mount for his 12 and a half inch F8. Clearly, Andy enjoyed building telescopes at least as much as he enjoyed <coughs> using them. In his early days with the club, or his early days with the club began about 1969. While he was never an active member, he did participate from time to time. The first meeting that he remembered attending was the home of Clarence Crott, the founder of the club. At that time, he was figuring the 12 and a half inch mirror for the club's telescope in his basement. Another meeting he remembered was at Lincoln High School. That night, somebody borrowed a school laser, and after the meeting, they went up on the roof to look through the dome. There, the laser was projected onto a nearby water tower, and he remembered being somewhat disappointed by the large dot when viewed through the small portable telescope. He just thought it would be smaller. Another meeting happened at the home of Larry Kalinowski around 1970. An interesting topic was was uh, in regard an interesting topic was uh, an interesting topic was stereo 3D pictures slides projected by two Kodak slide projectors through Polaroid filters were combined onto a screen and viewed as one large amazing 3D image with Polaroid glasses and he thought this was pretty cool and promptly started making his own 3D slides in 1984, he bought his home in Ray Township, where he, bought, he built two impressive observatories, a 5-meter and a 75-inch. 75-inch, Andy? The, the small observatory? So that was 75-inch? The observatory? Oh, I had a, yeah, a 6-foot. Okay. And, and the 72-inch. It's 15-foot. All right. <clears throat> Through the 80s and 90s, Andy was a regular visitor at AstroFest near Kankakee, Illinois. About that time, he began building the 17 and a half inch Obsession clone with a Steve Swayze refigured mirror. Dave Kriege was at AstroFest and said it was one of the best he had seen mechanically and optically. It also was a show winner. Andy, Andy's interest was also caught by Astrophysics, a manufacturer who was producing magical APO refractors. He bought their 7-inch Starfire F9 
and in 2006 bought the APO, the AP1200 GTO. He also bought a used Mead 16-inch McCassegrin in 2006 and had new optics installed at the Mead factory. And he loves that telescope particularly and noted that it has excellent optics. Andy was an active and accomplished ATMer and completed many projects including several Alta azimuth mounts and a 5 inch refractor that he machined himself and a 2 inch F20 brass refractor. Of course he never lost his beloved 12 and a half inch F8 reflector. So Andy's hard work and skills landed him a job at General Motors in Pontiac and then with the clandestine group Skunk Works at the Tech Center. In 2004 Andy began having health issues with his heart and suffered a stroke in 2011. Also in 2011, after 25 years as part of Skunk Works with General Motors, he retired. He looks back, he looks back on his career with General Motors with fondness and remarks that he had fun every day. He's proud of the contributions that he made on many notable projects and also for the opportunity to work on projects for his favorite pastime. <coughs> There he is machining rings for his telescope. I'm sure it was on lunch. <laughs> when he wasn't working, I'm sure he was sitting at his desk staring out this window and then thinking about future projects that he could work on. And he also has interests in photography and film developing, woodworking, and rocket building. He's not as mobile as he would like to be, and with the club needing a good mount, he figured that the Warren Astronomical Society would get more use of his astrophysics mount than he was going to get using it. Andy's best friend in astronomy, Scott Hartsma, passed away a few years ago, and Andy thought of him as a true astronaut. He will always miss Scott. He also misses taking trips out left, west with just his telescope. I asked him about his lifelong interest in astronomy, and he said that he can't figure out what kept his interest all these years. He said he guesses that he just likes working with and on telescopes. Some of his fondest memories are building and using his 12 and a half inch F8 reflector using a 16-inch Schmidt-Cassegrin, which he considers his favorite telescope, a private tour of the Lowell Observatory that he was, that he was able to uh, receive, a 1984 solar eclipse in South Carolina with his friend Scott, observing Comet Hale-Bopp from his backyard. Also, a triple transit of Jupiter's moons in 1979 <coughs> which he noted occurred at 1 a.m. while the temperatures dropped down to about 7 below zero. One of his most notable memories with astronomy was meeting Gary Ross in 1973. I'm sure that doesn't surprise anybody. He had never met anyone like him, and he said that Gary hitchhiked 160 miles from Detroit to Kissing Rock and on being questioned about not having a car, Gary simply replied, I don't need one. This is an image of how Gary sees life. And a motto that he likes to follow. Life is good, you keep it simple, do what you like, and like what you do. This is a guy I see when I think of Andy.
back to the cool guy. Um, Andy was, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, just an incredible gesture and a very generous gift. So, thank you again. I didn't want to get thrown away. Yep. Like some, some months are. Well, we appreciate it. Tomorrow, my wife wouldn't want to do it. So, yeah. Do it right now. Hopefully, that doesn't happen for a while. All of the things that have been going on at Stargate have have come up because of um, really a single event. Um, you know, a rather tragic one. Uh, Longtime member Larry Kalinowski. He passed away, and um, while that was a tragic event for us, um, what followed was, was um, a gesture that was very kind, very generous. His family, uh, in his honor, donated a large sum of money that was going to be put toward the telescope, put toward the observatory to do something really special. And, um, you know, it's really... It's brought a lot of people together. It's motivated a lot of people. And it's given us this incredible telescope, this incredible piece of equipment that we have today. So really, it's, we're, we're here talking about all of this because, because of Larry. Um, his family donated the money, but um, in doing a little bit of research about the guy, um, it doesn't surprise me that his family is as generous as he seemed to be as a member. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Larry and, and his background. Obviously, I knew who Larry was back in the 70s. Um, he kind of looked like one of my uncles. Uh, he was a very nice guy back then. I felt really comfortable being able to approach him and talk to him. And you know, as a 13-year-old kid, you can get easily intimidated by adults, um, especially when you're dwarfed intellectually, like tends to happen often here at least for me. Um, anyway, in, in doing some of the research, I came across an article by um, Seal Bonadano, I think uh, is her name. And she was a member um, 10, 15 years ago, and she wrote up a really nice article. I've uh, shamelessly paid, plagiarized that article and, and added to it in some instances. So uh, a significant amount of credit for what I'm about to say goes to her. Um, Larry was born on March 13, 1937, at Crinton Hospital in Detroit. He passed away April 7, 2010. Larry's childhood was spent living in Detroit in Hamtramck, and not much is known about it. And his son, his son Mark, said he never spoke much of about much about it. Um, Mark believed it's because of a strained relationship he had with his father. He met and married Janice or Joanne, his wife, in 1964. And they had two sons. Mark and Keith. Larry was interested in electronics early on and studied for two years at the Electronic Institute of Technology or the Detroit Institute of Technology. Yep, I got both, both names. Uh, both schools e existed and they both have since closed their doors. Uh, regardless, his schooling eventually landed him a job at General Motors Tech Center that he held his entire career, a career that he retired from in 1998. Larry's contributions to the society were countless. He was a prolific contributor to the, uh, to the WASP from an early time and for many years wrote the computer and astro chatter columns for the newsletter. Uh, almost right off the bat, you can find articles published in the WASP on astrophotography, observing uh, a whole variety of things. Um, and of course, the, the astronomical exposure guide, which was extremely popular. I'm um, still using it today. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, if you're using film and taking photos, it's still uh, as applicable as it ever was. Um, he was very proud to be the, the founder of the computer user group that used to exist in the club.
His dedication to comet observing and his desire for other members to join him in rigorous observing led him to take over the club's obser observing awards program, in which capacity he awarded hundreds of beautiful handmade badges to members who earned them. He created handmade and sold a Barlow extender to allow people on limited budgets to boost their magnification without buying new eyepieces. If there was a project that the club worked on, an event that we hosted, or a way he could help fellow members, Larry did it with enthusiasm, skill, and caring. Larry first became interested in astronomy while a student at Detroit Pershing, Hospital, uh, Detroit Pershing High School back in 1955. Uh, 1955. He brought up the subject during his physics class, and afterwards a young man by the name of Bill Whitney introduced himself to Larry. Larry made a trip to Bill's house where he got his first close-up view of the moon. The view absolutely amazed him and started his lifelong love of astronomy. Bill Whitney invited Larry to a meeting at the Detroit Astronomical Society where he took advantage of the society's meetings to learn how to build his own telescope a six-inch reflector, an endeavor that took about one year to complete, and for ten years, Larry used it as primary observing tool and said years ago that it was still working as beautifully decades later. He remained a member of the Detroit Astronomical Society until about 1962, at which point he joined the Warren Astronomical Society and for a time belonged to both clubs. Back in the 50s and 60s, when you wanted to stargaze, you didn't have to travel so far to escape the city lights. Larry recalled his favorite observing spot being a place north of Pontiac called Bald Mountain. As the years crept up on Larry, he reluctantly turned, to, turned into a warm weather observer and would go into a cocoon once temperatures dropped below freezing. He would mention that it had something to do with the fact that his feet always froze first. Larry's astronomical interests moved from the moon to comets. He recalled a couple very special ones that turned up in the late 70s, Comet Bennett and Comet West, with a few years between the two. He said that the comets from head to tail took up as much as a third of the night sky. He remembers them being very brilliant and compares them to the more recent comet Hale Bob. Well, this was written in 98, so it's the not so recent Hale Bob. <coughs> um, the photographs here don't correlate specifically with what I'm talking about, but they are pictures of Larry, ones that I could get. Um, the gentleman I don't know in the middle, does, does anybody know who that is? I know it's Gary Ross on the left and Larry Kalinowski on the right, but. I'm not sure who was by the telescope. Hmm. In addition to his preparation, or his participation with WASP, WASP activities, Larry was the Astronomical League's treasurer for a couple of years. Even, there, even then, Larry was involved with computers. He encouraged people who wrote free astronomical software to share their written code with him, he in turn would distribute it to other League members who desired a copy. Later on, the Astronomical League decided to use an internet BBS to post that type of information. He even took a stab at programming and wrote a DOS-based Messier, uh, Messier Observer's Guide. A few years ago, in recalling his original memories of the Warren Astronomical Society, he said, at that time, the Warren Club was both a telescope making and an observing group. Over time, the telescope making group disappeared slowly. Probably, he speculates, because of the availability of reasonably priced commercial telescopes. Hmm. Back then, the WAS membership hovered around 20 to 25. Over the years, Larry saw the club membership swell to over 100 members, including a higher percentage of women. Larry made many contributions to the Warren Astronom Astronomical Society over the years. He served as a club's president in the 60s, participated at many Stargate Observatory cleanup days, worked on the club's 22-inch 
a little, but not as much as some other members. And he regularly contributed to the WASP and wrote the Larry F. Kalinowski Astronomical Exposure Guide. He was responsible for forming the computer user group so that members had an interest in both astronomy and the computing world, and they had a forum to discuss those. Another notable contribution was that of being a regular and consistent member attendee. You could always count on Larry to be at the meetings and at Stargate for star parties. And he was once referred to as Old Faithful, but after a short conversation, noted that he would prefer to be known as Young Faithful. <laughs> Larry was happy to discuss computers with any member. Sorry, misprint. <laughs> so. All right. Uh, one of his first, uh, one of his fondest experiences in astronomy. This is speculation through Gary Ross and uh, his son Mark. Uh, one of his fondest experiences in astronomy may have been an ill-fated, hastily organized, and disastrous trip to witness a total solar eclipse in 1959 to Mount Wachusett in Massachusetts. <laughs> Larry later entertained the club by recounting the mishaps along the way in a matter-of-fact, monotone delivery that only made it much more entertaining to hear. Mm. Those who remember Larry have commented on his dedication to the club, his willingness to lend a hand to anyone in need, and that he was a gentleman, kind and intelligent. So, uh, we talked about past, present, and kind of uh, maybe the future of where we're going to go with Stargate. Um, we've talked about some things that we want to do. Obviously, the ability to observe the sun in hydrogen alpha. So, we're considering a Lunt solar scope that will be... Uh, mounted on the refractor, but also uh, very uh, easily removed and put on a separate mount so that it can be used for outreach and it can be taken away from the observatory and uh, used wh wherever the outreach is being conducted. Um, there's deep sky video cams. The uh, Malin cam is an incredible uh, piece of equipment that uh, basically um, allows you to see deep, you know, very dim images, very brightly. Um, interesting thing for the observatory is that when you have a crowd of 50 people, you know, they can all view the image simultaneously. Mm. Um, I'm a little partial to looking through a piece of glass, but, but these are pretty cool. So uh, there's additional Eagle Scout projects that Bob Berta mentioned. Um, Brick paver ramp in front of a dob shed is something that's being discussed and uh, would likely happen in the spring, as well as an all-weather projection screen on the south side of the observatory where we currently project onto the bricks. Um, we're also uh, talking with the scouts about permanent all-weather bench seating for lectures on the south side of the building as well. The dome, the buildings, and the doors need new paint. And uh, we certainly can talk about other ideas if anybody has, has uh, anything that comes to mind. The, the scouts seem to be really ambitious. Um, I have a honeydew list here of things that have to happen. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, get involved and maybe has some ideas, then I would uh, graciously accept any help. Um, the dome drive motor remains temperamental. Uh, the concrete walkway around the observatory is, is compromised. Um, it's heaved several times. It needs to be re-leveled. And um, I think the best solution there is probably going to be uh, a contractor that can level concrete because the, the, the concrete itself is in pretty good shape. There's only two sections that are broken, but most of it can be lifted and re-leveled and put right back in place. 
Uh, there's a 12 volt power supply for accessories that will have cigarette style sockets that is mounted on the pier. Um, so if people are coming out with cameras or other equipment that requires DC power, you'll be able to get your power directly uh, from the pier. Um, I also plan on rebuilding the chart table with an illuminated self-storing chart table uh, in place of the existing one. The 70 to 90 millimeter finder is still being discussed. Um, what do they run? The well, um, I looked at one. I think the Astrophysics website, 70 millimeter. I want to say it was $600. I'll, I'll post and put it yeah. to buy it. I'm putting it on. So you just find the one you want, and we'll do it. Well, thank you very much. Done. Um, so I got all excited. Ben's going to buy another telescope for us. <laughs> Hit the button too soon. Um, obviously, we want to be able to provide some some uh, camera mounts for you guys, so you'll be able to use the telescope for astrophotography. Um, and that kind of goes in hand in hand with the sliding counterweight for the optical tube. Which, sorry. Um, we are uh, looking at adding as well. Um, again, any other ideas that that you guys might know of that I'm not thinking of, we can we can discuss those as well. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that for everybody that participated, everybody that helped uh, along the way, I'm uh, sincerely grateful for the help that you offered. And that is all I have, other than answering any questions that anybody has. So, does anybody have any questions? Or I answered them all. Uh, how much of the original pier, in the, the foundation, is there? Was it just, was it? The new mount attached to that was there. Yeah, the the new mount is what we ended up doing was um, Andy actually fabricated a sleeve. He had a section of pipe that is identical to our existing mount. It's the exact same pipe. So he built a sleeve that slid down over the the pipe that extended the height. I think about a total of what eight inches, nine inches. Is that all it was? In the end. So raise it up a little bit, and then the the, the um, cap piece, um, Andy's pier is like basically at his house is the same tube, right? It's the same pipe. So he didn't have to do any excavations or anything. Oh no no. What was no, in the ground? Already? Not at all. Nope. Just okay. extended the existing the existing pier. Did you have trouble uh, with one of the holders that it might hit? Um, yeah, that's something I didn't touch base on. And in the telescope right now, um, we're not exactly sure that it can actually hit anything. It looks pretty safe, but we haven't put the dew cap on yet, the dew shield. And with the dew shield on, you know, there is definitely an opportunity that it can hit the drive <coughs> motor. So when we refigure and rework that drive motor, we want to get that out of the way, try and get it out of the way completely. Um, in the meantime, what we'll probably have to do if we're, if this, the telescope's going to slew to an object that could possibly pass, you know, near that, then we'll, what we'll do is we'll manually slew past it and, and then have it go to the object so that that doesn't happen. Hey, Joe, is it possible to slew the dome with the telescope? Have, a, have a, an interface? Um, yeah. There is, and it's really complicated to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, um, if there's any electrical engineers that want to work with me on that, it's, it's um, I actually was approached by um, uh, Dennis Schmausel a few years, uh, like 12 years ago when he was building domes to build an interface like that for the company that I worked for. And uh, it was a funny conversation because he called me out of the blue and said, hey, I'm, this, I'm an astronomer and I'm building domes. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Okay, you got my ear. So then we started talking about Stargate and turned out, you know, 
I was not active at the time, but anyway, it turned out to be not cost effective to, to develop it. It's, you need encoders and uh, some circuitry to, to do the calculations, and that's beyond me. I'm a technician, not an engineer. Anybody else? Let's uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder that uh, after uh, this meeting, those who would like uh, can get together for some uh, good times talking with each other.